I'm actually just really disappointed. I, I uh, wanted to vote for Judge Garland. I was looking forward to doing so. I expected to vote for Judge Garland. I had even suggested Judge Garland's name uh, when the vacancy occurred uh, in the last administration in the FBI director's slot. No idea whether he would have taken it. Didn't happen. I've got great, great respect for him. Uh, he's, a, he's a hero. I mean, he's, he's, he was a longtime prosecutor. He put away some very bad people as a prosecutor. He's got a distinguished career over almost a quarter century on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I've had um, a handful of interactions with him over the years, some in social settings, others uh, in a professional setting. I, I've always been really impressed with him. He's a, a genuine, decent person um, and someone who, um, who I think I would enjoy working with in any capacity. And so it was with that mindset that I came into these hearings. I was uh, very disappointed that in response to a number of my questions in the first round, I didn't get um, answers. And it's not that I wasn't getting the answer that I wanted, it's that I wasn't getting a substantive answer at all in response to a substantive question. I understand the need uh, uh, for candidates for judicial office to invoke the judicial canons. I, I understand the need for a sitting judge in other circumstances to avoid <clears throat> answering policy questions in public or legal hypotheticals. We were informed uh, at the outset of, of this hearing with Judge Garland that, um, that he would engage with us on this uh, and that the judicial canons wouldn't stop him from uh, talking about the, the office for which he's been nominated now. So I had hoped and, and expected that we would get more by way of substantive dialogue and engagement than we did. When that didn't happen in the first round, I, I thought maybe it'll go better in the second round. I asked him a separate set of questions in our second round at the hearing and still uh, got a number of non-answers. Um, I would note here that um, look, in, in many interpersonal interactions, when people interact as friends or in a social setting, even as, uh, as people interact in this body with each other, members of the public, not everybody feels the need to answer every question directly every time. But in some settings, you expect some answer. For example, um, I spent a good part of my, uh, my professional career before I became a senator 10 years ago um, as a litigator, as a lawyer appearing regularly before um, uh, federal courts of appeals. Whether in a federal court of appeals or any other court, I always knew, I always understood. I'd been trained uh, from a young age. When you're asked a question by a judge or a panel of judges, uh, as, as normally happens on appeal, you do have to answer the question, even if it's not the question you want to answer. And if it's a hypothetical, you've got to engage in a meaningful way with the hypothetical. You've got to provide an answer. And, and it, it, is, it can't just be the answer that you wanted to get. You're also taught as a lawyer that when you go into a courtroom and if you try to skirt that rule, there will be consequences. You're probably not going to get the relief that you want. Depending on the judge, uh, you could potentially even be sanctioned. Uh, you're also not likely to be able to sit down when it's your turn to make an argument until you've actually answered the question. They just don't let that happen. <clears throat> judge Garland is, is familiar with this rule. He's presided over and participated in uh, many, many thousands of cases and, and uh, many thousands of oral arguments. If someone in his courtroom just declined to answer uh, the question asked, whether as a hypothetical or otherwise, or instead answered the question that he wished uh, had been asked. I don't think Judge Garland and his colleagues would put up with that. I think there would be consequences to the attorney they wouldn't be pleasant. More importantly, they wouldn't even be able to sit down um, uh, until they had answered the question. Now, that's why this was disappointing. Still, I wanted to vote for him, and I signaled publicly and privately that I hoped and expected to be able to vote for him. I just needed answers to a couple of questions. They didn't even have to be answers that I wholeheartedly agreed with, but there needed to be some sort of meaningful engagement on them. 
So I gave him additional chances, genuinely hoping that I'd get answers in the questions for the record. Now, I asked more than usual, uh, in part uh, because of this feature. I wanted to give him a chance. What I got was even less forthcoming than what we got in the in-person hearing. Well, the reason I say all of this is that I really do like him. I, certainly he's going to be confirmed. Look forward to working with him and getting to know him better. This was an unforced error. It didn't have to be this way. I wish he could have gotten my vote. I think I strongly suspect there are people advising him who are telling him not to answer. I don't think that's a, a good precedent or a good policy for us to set that with someone nominated to be the Attorney General of the United States that it's not important to engage in a meaningful way on questions that we asked, <clears throat> that we've asked, legitimate questions uh, that need answers. One of the areas where he did provide some substantive answer <clears throat> provided a sharp contrast to the areas where I didn't get an answer. When I asked him questions uh, in person in the hearing and then repeated those same questions in my questions for the, uh, for the record, again, um, hoping that I'd get more of an answer in writing that I got in person, I had several questions about statements and or policy positions taken by a couple of high-level Department of Justice nominees uh, from President Biden that I found troubling. I wasn't looking for any particular answer, other, although I had hoped that it might be something along the lines of, if that's what so-and-so said, I don't agree with that statement. Didn't get that. And in some instances, what I got in response to it was along the lines of, I know so-and-so, her views are perfectly aligned with my views. And that was the only answer I got. Had the statements and positions in question not been particularly troubling, particularly troubling especially considering the context of the nomination and the position, the two positions in question, I might have considered that less of a material issue. It doesn't have to be this way, and I hope that other nominees from this administration particularly high-level nominees to serve in the Department of Justice. We'll take our questions seriously. Unlike a court, we in this committee aren't inclined to sanction people. I don't even think we're equipped to do that. It would be a bad idea if we equipped ourselves with the ability to do that. We're not a court. We don't hold people in contempt uh, for coming here and not, not answering uh, in the same way that a court might. doesn't mean it's meaningless. It doesn't mean they don't have to provide any answer or expend any effort to try to address the substance of what's behind the question. I think we owe our committee that, and um, I think our constituents expect more. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to first address, as Senator Lee, my friend's remark,